Yep, got it. Go for it. Excellent. All right, thank you, Bruce. Um, as Bruce said, we're you know here to sort of share um, what we did last year uh, and also what we're planning this year. But the circumstances were that we had to throw this together very quickly, um, and we're still very new to giving days. So very happy for this to be a conversation and to hear feedback and an input from other people about where we can potentially take this in the future as well. Um, Bruce gave me a bit of a framework to work through, and the first question was, why did we do a giving day? Um, hopefully you can figure out what's about to happen in this uh, image for yourself. It kind of sums up why we, um, why we had to do a giving day. So about 12 months ago, as you all know, COVID-19 hit very quickly. Um, hear and say at that stage, we're quite heavily focused on fundraising events. And we had three planned between, I think, the end of March and May. Um, we had to cancel all three very quickly. Uh, the net, the anticipated net result from the three events was about a quarter of a million dollars. Um, which for here and say is a significant amount of money. At the same time, and as a clinical service, um, where we receive a large amount of funding from NDIS, we didn't know what the future of our clinical services looked like, um, how effectively we could transfer face-to-face -face sessions to um, online telehealth, I guess. Um, while it works for a lot of organisations, it's very difficult to do an hour session with a three-year-old via Zoom. So um, we had a lot of uncertainty. We also had some fairly low reserves at that time. Um, so in the couple of years before that, the transition to NDIS meant that we moved from a model of block funding up front to individual funding from families and arrears. So it caused quite a few cash flow issues. Um, so with that uncertainty, we pretty much reduced all staff to 80%. Um, and as I say, with the cancellation of three events, things weren't looking great financially. Um, so we had to come up with a solution very quickly. And this, for me, was the most important thing we did. So we could have gone you know, very quickly, let's launch an emergency appeal. Um, but we actually, we got permission in a challenging time from our board and CEO to actually take our time. Um, so we entered into a design thinking exercise. This really, if you look at the first two stages there, empathize and define, what that enabled us to do was take a moment to step back and identify who our people actually are. So we identified three key audiences, um, really senior Australians. So we have a core group of, um, I guess, older Australians who supported here and say for the best part of 30 years and have a strong connection with our founder, Dr. Dimity Dornan. Um, the families of here and say, so during that 30 years, we've benefited over a thousand families statewide who feel a strong connection to the organisation because of the impact um, it's achieved for their children. And also our corporate partners. We have, again, a small but core group of corporate partners who are very connected um, to what we do. So by researching who those audiences actually were and then, I guess, reframing the problem from their perspective. So we didn't head into this saying our problem is that we're, you know, we're facing a shortfall of quarter of a million dollars. We headed into this saying, the problem is that people who supported us for 30 years, who deeply care about the organization, um, are concerned about what they might lose. Uh, the families who benefit from our clinical services are concerned that those clinical services might not be here in the future. So by doing that, we could identify by, I guess, why people care, um, what's important to them, um, but then also things like how do they like to be communicated with and who do they connect with? So who's the right person in the organisation to speak to them? 
from that stage, we could then head into the brainstorming. So what we did, and I think we had a group of six people in this, I think it was a half day planning session. Um, I'd done some initial research and come up with 10 case studies of digital fundraising programs that have worked elsewhere globally. So we split the six into two groups. We gave them the 10 case studies, just a paragraph on each. And we asked them to delve into those case studies in a bit more detail and really have a look at what had worked elsewhere, but to take out of that what could work for here and say in our current situation. Um, and the idea being that no idea was off limits. So we set a thing for the day actually, which was, um, I think, optimism and creativity. So what we wanted to remove from this session was. Um, those statements like, but I don't think that will work, or we've done that before and it didn't work. So the rule we kind of set is if anybody goes down that you know, line of thinking, but you're to come back with, but what if? So it's absolutely a positive um, session and it explores every opportunity and, you know, absolute depth, I guess. Um, from there, we moved into the sort of prototype. So the two groups did their research, they came back and as it happened, they presented pretty much identical um, solutions to our problem, which were around the opportunity to do a match giving day. Um, so then we pitched that to our CEO. Um, we put some costings around it and an income forecast. And then we engaged my call as our platform and the agency to, to guide us through the whole giving day. Um, with the help of my cause, um, some of our key donors and some of our families, and also we kind of shared the prototype with people in the industry. So I think, um, I think Bruce, we shared that with you for a bit of feedback as well. Mm -hmm. And that really helped us refine what our best proposal actually was. Um, so what came out of that was the here and say, here to stay giving day. Um, so the whole idea of the here to stay was that it's a positive aspirational statement. We wanted to be here to stay for the next 30 years, but it also just planted, I guess, a seed of doubt in people's mind that that was even a question, that there was an element of risk attached to the future um, of the organization. Um, we planned and executed this in about seven weeks. So from that first design session to the actual giving day was, was no more than seven weeks. Um, and it was our first match giving campaign. So we went out initially to some of our, you know, most connected major supporters, and we were able to build a match giving pool of about $130,000. And that gave us a fantastic start when the day came. Um, couple of the reasons we went for the giving day. So I think research um, shows that 84% of people are more likely to donate to a charity when match giving is offered. And I think the average gift that a person um, donates actually increases by about 22% um, because of that match element as well. Um, I'll just talk about the warm up campaign. So, this was a really crucial tactic, I think. So, with a giving day, the advice was keep it under wraps. Don't tell anybody until two weeks before the giving day. Um, so, that gives you a really kind of intense giving day period and a sense of urgency where people are more likely to donate. But what we did before that, we had a four week campaign on our social media. Um, and we went into the history of the organization. So we aim to build a, a sense of connection and nostalgia to the brand. So the first post was basically going back 30 years as to why Dr. Timothy Gordon first founded here, let's say, um, what the problem was that she identified and, and how she saw um, such an organization as a solution. And then over four weeks, we kind of chronologically just told the story. Um, so all the key milestones, the key achievements. And what we found as we got towards the end of that warm-up campaign is that the language on our social media had changed to, I guess, from how amazing the stories were to 
how can we support them? How, we, how can we donate? So by the time we launch Giving Day, people were already in that headspace that, you know, they felt a strong connection to that history, that nostalgia. Um, and they really wanted to help us um, be around for the future. Um, so when we executed the Giving Day itself, you know, some of the key tactics, um, it was really the whole range. So it essentially became our tactic deal as well. So the DM was such an important part of that. And if you go back to our audiences, that really connected um, group of senior Australians like to receive the DM. Um, they like to sit at home with their cup of tea, open the mail, read through the stories. Um, and many prefer to, to donate by check still. So we, we kept the DM and, and if a donation came in by check, we could simply load that onto the donation page ourselves. Um, social was obviously a, a huge part. Um, and one of the things there we did, we worked with a PR company called Ruby Communications. So we launched a, I think it was a hashtag gift sound share sound campaign, where we asked people to share their favorite sound on social media and, and tag other people to do the same. We got some really good celebrity uptake from um, people like Alex Dimonor, um, Charlie Robinson was another one. What we found in the end was a fantastic awareness piece and an engagement piece, um, possibly didn't convert to fundraising income. Um, so that's something we're looking at this year to how we can refine that to something that actually converts. Um, other tactics, website pop-up is something we haven't done before at here and say. Um, that really converted. We had a lot of donations come directly through the pop-up on the home page. Um, phone was crucial. So so again, here and say traditionally have been very protective of our donors. Um, we hadn't engaged in telefundraising before, and the organization was always adamant that's not something we do. Um, it's amazing how a, a bit of a crisis and a sense of urgency can change people's thinking. Um, so we introduced that for this campaign, but to a very select group of donors, again, our most connected people. But the other fun tactic was we've also always kept our family and our fundraising databases separate. So again, here and say very protective of our families who come here for clinical services. And we haven't directly talked to them before the fundraising team. Um, what we did, we have a we have a school screening team at here and say they go out to schools and they check the um, hearing of children in prep and grade one classes. Obviously during COVID they couldn't do that. They had a bit of time on their hands. So we got our school screening team to call a clinical family about two days before giving day. Um, and not to ask for donations, but to say, hey, two days time, we're having a giving day. Um, the success of it really depends on reaching large numbers. Would you share this via social media? And would you add your personal story and tell people why you care? Um, we had an overwhelmingly positive response to those phone calls. And even though we weren't asking for donations, you know, one mom kind of answered the phone, I think she was in the supermarket. She said, look, sorry, I don't have time to chat, but can you send me an email? Um, the next day she made a four figure donation. So while we weren't asking for donations, they were inspired to donate and they shared that campaign widely as well. Um, other tactics, SMS, again, we hadn't done that before. To be honest, it didn't return an awful lot, and I'm not sure we'll go, go down that route this year. Um, and also some champions. So we had some ambassadors for the campaign. And what we could do is we could set them up with a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising page so that they could tell their story, they could directly go to their contacts. And again, when their contacts donated, their gifts were automatically doubled as well. So, so that worked quite well for us. Um, the result, I guess to, to get on my soapbox a little bit, I get, probably get a bit frustrated when we as fundraisers talk about results in terms of uh, money. So, you know, if somebody says, what did you do last year? And you say, I raised half a million dollars. It's simply an output. It's an output that leads to some more important impact. 
So the result was, as you can see in the picture, um, that children with a hearing loss, um, even children born profoundly deaf, are still learning to listen and speak, thanks to what we achieved on Giving Day. Um, how did that happen? Basically, 709 generous donors came forward. Um, they gifted just over $300,000 and a net result of $290,000. Um, we achieved a media reach in excess of, I think, 43 million people. Um, and that included national TV coverage on channels 7, 9, and 10. Um, 318 donors were new acquisitions. And I think 150 were lapsed as well. So if you think back to that initial issue that caused us to go down this track, three highly intensive fundraising events were going to be worth $250,000. An online digital campaign raised a net result of $290,000. Um, and it did so at a return on investment of about 15 to 1. Um, one of the events we were planning was going to return about a dollar fifty to every dollar invested. So it's kind of shown us, you know, the future as well, which is you know really promising, I guess. Um, so what does that look like this year? This year's a you know a bit of a challenge in a way. Um, the here to stay messaging really works, but we don't feel we can go there again. We can't turn around to our audience every year and say, hey guys, we're in trouble again, we need your help. Um, so we had to reframe what that looked like. So for consistency, we kept the, the look and feel very similar. We kept our babies born deaf can't wait tagline because that really resonated with people. But what we've done is we've gone back to our major gift partners. We said, hey, it really worked, it resonated with people. Um, do you think this year we can build this match giving pool where we can actually triple people's gifts? So this year we're going to go with a here and say triple impact day um, in the hope that that triple impact gives us a real point of difference and something new and exciting for last year's uh, match giving day. Um, again, we know the warm-up campaign really worked. We probably can't repeat the same again and just go for the same chronological history of here and say. So what we've done this year, we, you know, whenever we talk to people about here and say, um, the way to help them understand what we do is always to say, you know, have you seen um, the cochlear implant switch on videos on YouTube where children hear for the first time? Um, you know, most people have and most people have been moved by that. So what we're doing for the next four weeks is um, simply sharing a whole series of our switch-ons historically, sharing them on social media, we're sharing it with the tagline, um, babies with hearing loss can hear and speak. So a really positive statement, letting people know what's actually possible. The moment we launch Giving Day, that switches over to babies born deaf can't wait. Um, fingers crossed, that's gonna be a success for us again. I think last year, was unique and I think a lot of people um, came out of the woodwork to, to help us in a time of need. I'm not expecting the same results again, um, but effectively this replaces our annual tax appeal. The annual tax appeal used to raise about $80,000. Um, so a digital giving day that raises potentially $250,000, $300,000, um, again, is a significant step forward from that. Um, I think that's about it. As I said, I think Tim's going to go next, but I'm really keen to hear uh, feedback and ideas from other people on what's worked elsewhere. Um, we are still learning in this space, so definitely always keen to learn from others. Um, otherwise, thanks for your time. I appreciate you listening. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. We, yeah, as you said, we'll, we'll um, keep the feedback till the end just so Tim can get through his uh, section. Um, so hold on to those questions uh, till the end or, or the feedback. I think Tim's just wrestling with his tech equipment here. Uh, you're good to go. Sorry, it's perfect timing that my kids have to get their school bags out of my office. Oh. So hold on one just second. Oh, this is life, hey? 
Very cool. We've got some good branding. I'm back. Oh, you're back. All good. Sorry. All right. Go for it. Well, first of all, Bruce, um, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to to share and present uh, You Belong and, and our Bike to Belong campaign. And uh, the opportunity, I know I'm going to get to get some really good feedback. So I really appreciate that, mate. All good. And uh, Jim, thanks for sharing. Man, I feel like... Um, You've done such a good job um, and congratulations on last year's appeal. And, um, and I've, I've already been writing down notes, uh, learning from how, how well you've done. You're going to get a bit of a different, different um, approach from me. Uh, we're still very much a startup and very much developing our whole fundraising campaign. So let me just kind of share with you, I guess, the first, the pitch of, of our Bike to Belong campaign and and hopefully you'll learn a bit about what you belong is too and what we do. I'm going to share my screen here. And let me know if that comes up. You got that there? Yep, perfect. Fantastic. Well, Bike to Belong, um, here it is. There's 80 million displaced people and we're asking people to bike 80 kilometers in the world. Um, and I'm trying to find out why it is not. There we go. So there are 80 million people in the world that are displaced. And that's, that's three times the population of Australia, which is actually mind boggling when you think about it. Um, it's the greatest humanitarian crisis we've, we've had since World War II. In fact, more people have been forcibly displaced from their homes than at any other time since World War II. Um, and uh, it all kind of began for me personally, um, when working with displaced people when uh, I moved with my family. There's three little kids there in that photo, but we now have a fourth. But when we were just three and the youngest was just eight weeks old, we moved our family to Iraq. And it was the same day that ISIS invaded Mosul. Um, and suddenly everybody heard about who ISIS was. And suddenly uh, 1.5 million people overnight um, were fled into the, the region that we had just moved to. And it kind of um, thrust us into a whole new area of work that we weren't, um, weren't planning on working with refugees. We we're planning on work. We we're working with um, world orphans at the time, working with um, at-risk children and widows from the various conflicts in the region. But suddenly for, for the next four years, we provided housing, education. We built and modeled a, a whole micro refugee village um, concept, um, trauma care and, and various relief work over those four years. And um, it was really quite, a, 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 you know, obviously life-changing experience for us um, as a family um, but we did end up moving back after four years my wife was pregnant with our fourth child which was a bit of a surprise and um, we ended up moving back to Australia but as we returned to Australia we realized there were suddenly all these refugee families that were now settling in the town of Toowoomba and we'd moved back to the Sunshine Coast at the time um, and Suddenly there was these Iraqi and Syrian Yazidi speaking culturally, they're different. They have a different religion. We're now almost 2000 had been settled in the town of Toowoomba and they were struggling to integrate in the community. The community has done a phenomenal job there, but this, this was, um, yeah, um, quite a challenge for them. And so um, within just a few couple of months of being back from Australia, I, I teamed up with phenomenal local um, professionals as well as, as just volunteers wanting to help, grandmas wanting to go visit families. And we formed You Belong Australia. That was back in 2017. And our whole aim and mission at the time was just simply to welcome refugees. And it's um, evolved over the years um, into um, really adding an empowerment component, um, providing not only just welcome and social um, programs to help them integrate relationally into the community, but also to, um, to get them on that pathway towards integration, independence, um, through educational, the powerful tool of learning the English language, which they were struggling with. And so we've had, we've developed some 
real kind of um, unique approaches to our 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 programs that are having um, a tremendous impact and we're seeing so many of these families engaged in the community and if you look at it like this if you come into a foreign land bringing with you incredible trauma and and pain and loss and grief and if you're able to connect socially within the community gain friends you will learn the language so much quicker you will get connected in jobs you will get in so many ways, you will um, you'll connect and you'll thrive in that community. Um, and so it's not just enough for there to be professional services at your disposal. It really, um, for us, we found it, it hinges on that sense of belonging, that sense of community, that sense of um, that enables people to in, integrate and essentially thrive. And then there's also this, the other side of it that we're very passionate about is that it's not just a benefit for them. It's a benefit for us and our communities that they have so much to teach us and we have so much to learn and enriched our lives. And that's what Australia is. We are a multicultural society. And so what we've just asked people to join us now in our first kind of official um, fundraising campaign um, to to bike to belong during World Refugee Week. World Refugee Week, we really f- felt that we needed to not only um, uh, focus on on ways that we can raise support, but importantly, ways awareness. And so that's why we went with a, a, an event like this, because we felt like we really, as a, a new startup charity, we needed to get our our, our work out there and, and be more visible in the community. And so, um, yeah, we're asking people to yeah, ride during World Refugee Week, 80 Ks. That's, um, we've gone from Sunday to Sunday. So it's eight days for the 80 million displaced people in our world. We've through my work overseas, we've got some great partnerships in in Iraq and Uganda, where we'll also be sending proceeds to help um, with with uh, families that are on the front, um, um, yeah, in the in the front lines in refugee camps that are providing some great great work um, in trauma care and and help to those there as well. Um, this is a bit about uh, you can learn more on our website but uh, we really wanted to create an inclusive event as well um, that it didn't just appeal to those that are really gun cyclists but we wanted people that um, you know uh, could could really tailor it um, and uh, so whether you're a mountain bike rider or whether you're just a kid that rides around on your bike or like us, we ride most weekends down to the farmer's market or to the beach as a family and, and, and enjoy something like that where you could still participate. You didn't feel like you needed to, to have to be, you know, a, a lycra loving uh, gun cyclist. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that as you can see, this is kind of some snapshots from the site. There's um, there's ways you can choose your different way. We've got, we've, set some specific goals that people could set if they're if they want to do the mini challenge of 8k's or if you wanted to join a team and, and ride uh, longer you um, you can do that as well um, or you can just set your own custom goal and and obviously there's the the ideas and and the messaging around getting fit and and uh, learning more in the process about displaced people which um, I think here in Australia we we can sometimes be so r- far removed from the un- understanding and concept of what it means to be displaced and the experiences that they're having um, and um, yeah we really felt like we really want to be on the forefront of educating and helping um, people understand so that's that's it we're that's kind of our uh, my my brief kind of pitch campaign you know we want wanting to really um help people to see that refugees are just like every, every single one of us displaced people like me and you their mothers their fathers their children's brothers sisters and this quote here just really brings it home that um by khalid Hosseini, um that refugees are mothers fathers sisters brothers children with the same hopes and ambitions as us except that a twist of fate has bound their lives to a global refugee crisis on an unprecedented scale. And um, we're hoping that people uh, will will join with us and learn. So that's kind of the, uh, the pitch there. I'll stop sharing the screen. Am I back with you all? Yep. Awesome. How, how's things going um, with it, Tim? Can you sort of give us a bit of an idea of yeah, it's tracking. 
Yeah, so we, we just launched um, a, a couple weeks ago. Oh, we just lost you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Uh, sorry, I bumped. This is too fancy, this little mic. It's got <laughs> all these buttons on it. Um, we just launched a couple of weeks ago, opening registration fairly early to the actual campaign. As you know, it's in June. Um, and a lot of people might not consider signing up right away for something so far away, but we really felt like our first event, we wanted, we really needed to introduce the concept. Um, and so we've broken out our kind of marketing or um, campaign into three phases. One is the, what is it, you know, introducing people to what it is specifically who we are. So we're not, we're not going on the gun ho hard push to sign up just yet. Um, we've kind of, uh, that'll be sign uh, phase two is it will be that really encouraging people to participate, um, to get involved. Um, um, we've got potentially a couple of schools that might be in, engaging and, and participating with us. Um, and we're really kind of, yeah, doing the kind of groundwork of, 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 of spreading the word, word of mouth as well, encouraging people and, and just getting that that out there and then the third phase of course is then the donate push right so we've got a, a group of people and then we'll really be encouraging them as we get closer and as the as the week um of cycling is actually happening and people are seeing more more um activity on it that's when we're really going to do that the the major push for people to donate and get behind people's campaigns that they've set up so um how's it going um it's a lot of hard work, you know. We we like I said, we're a, a, a startup charity. We don't really have we don't have any full time paid staff, so it's a couple of um, incredible, you know, um, people that do a couple of days a week for us that are that are pulling all this together, as well as running out all the work they do to run the ch charity and work. So, um, but it's a wonderful experience for us all. Um, in in and to say that. Um, as well, um, and so we're really uh, we we got um, we've got a really exciting um, boost to our campaign. We have a couple of Olympians that are joining us for the campaign. They're going to Tokyo, and uh, they're Jordan and Elise Wood. They're actual kayakers, um, but what they're going to be doing is they're going to be training. They're pair making a team with a couple of former refugees um, that have just they came here only a year and a half ago. Um, and they're going to be coaching them um, through through the process to to actually ride the 80 Ks. And these former refugees, uh, one of them has never even been on a bike before. Um, and so it's going to be, I think, a beautiful story of how um, you know you've got um, you know a, a, some incredible. It's it's a picture of what our organisation really wants to be about. It's Australians that have been that are here, established Australians that are coming alongside our newest neighbours, and helping them um, to achieve their goals as they go as they also um, are, are setting out to to live their dream and and achieve their you know um, goal of competing and and uh, in the Olympics. So we're really excited about that, which has been a new development. We just shot a film, a bit of a video piece with them that we'll be releasing um, closer up. And I've got, I've had some really good connections with SBS and the Guardian newspaper to help with some um, PR releases again, closer on to the, to the, um, the, the event actually taking place. Um, again, it's our first time event. Um, I've never done anything like this. I remember getting on the phone with you uh, must've been a, maybe a couple months ago or, uh, maybe not even that long ago, maybe like six weeks ago, I was, Hey man, how do I even do this thing? Like, what, what do you reckon? And you gave me some great tips. Uh, Ruth Knight, who I don't know if she's still on with us, but, uh, Dr. Ruth Knight, um, with the ACPNS school. And, um, she hooked me up with a, a consultation with one of the um, FIA fundraisers of the year who, who sat down and really consulted with me and helped us kind of shift some of the, the idea around how we would market the event um, as a, as a virtual event. Obviously we didn't want to take the risk of doing an actual live event that would then need to be canceled. 
excuse me, and and she got us connected with Raisley as a good platform that we decided to go with. So, look, it's been a learning experience, um, to say the least. And uh, and yeah, we're early days, so um, it's hard for me to gauge. I've got nothing to compare it to um, as to to really what to expect. But um, yeah, we're really grateful. That's awesome. And I, I, I just want to encourage you, like what you've, what you've thrown together with, you know, um, I guess little resource, little time. And, and as you said, not, not doing something like this before is just phenomenal. It looks beautiful. Um, but I think what, what will set you apart and what does set you apart as, as an event, because there's so many bike rides out there, but the stories that you tell mm. and that, that experience that you'll give your participants, whoever they are, like you're going to take them on a journey that's, that's going to be different to anything that they've ever done. And I think, you know, even bringing it back to um, yourself with your family, you take your kids on bike rides, like just to be able to give people that opportunity to open their hearts and open their minds to people they might not have thought of before. I think that's what you can really offer mm. people. And that's, um, I think that's what you should really major on is that, um, that experience that you're giving people. It's not just a bike ride. It's what story yeah. are you telling along, along the way from now up until uh, refugee week. Like, I think that's, mm where you can really not capitalize that's not the right word but well i think you make a good point bruce because like there's so many bike riding events these days and there's so many peer-to-peer kind of uh coming out and so we had to really think well what's our point of difference what makes us different to everyone else that's asking you to ride in may or in june or july or every other month like what's why we really felt like for us it was yes we would love we you know, we really need to raise money we, uh, to go, you know, to, to develop and grow. But because it's our first year, we really wanted to make sure we were, um, we were tying it to something that, um, that, that was already, that really brought that awareness, that idea of tying it to World Refugee Week and a time of the year that, you know, hopefully there'll be a lot of other um, conversations around refugees happening during that week and on World Refugee Day, um, June 20th as well. Um, so, so yeah, that point of difference of what makes, what makes us different to everybody else was like you said, a part of telling the stories and bringing people on a journey um, with, with learning about refugees. And we've got a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of stories that will be coming out um, as well um, with our rather, like I think Jim really mentioned it, people don't, people, we want to add value to people. We don't just want to be there making the ask all the time. We really want them to learn about the stories and learn about these people. And that's part of our even whole mission as an organization is to, is to help people understand and have a much different um, perspective and, and understanding of 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 new Australians here um, that aren't always the negative news media stories and the of the gangs and of this and of that. You know, we really felt like people need to know that there's some so much positive news out there that often just doesn't get told. So um, they are the real heroes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a bold question, um, yeah. and it's a bold question of you, Tim, and of uh, the people here. But if if there was one problem. Or, uh, yeah, if you're trying to figure something out for this campaign, what could be that one problem that someone could solve here today? What answer you're looking for? Oh, uh, look, we all want, I think we all want that secret sauce, don't we? That secret ingredient that's just going to, without any energy or, or if it make a change. But... I would I would love input and help on um, because we're right now we're in the sign up phase. Um, marketing is just such a, a challenging thing for me. It's not something I'm always that great at. Um, but yeah, how do we how do we engage participation right now? How do we get more people signing up in this startup phase? Would be the the main thing because from that everything else 
comes, right? Once you've got people engaged and participating, that's where the, the fundraising dollars can come in. That's where the the sharing and the and the and the um, awareness can grow. So yeah, that's our number one challenge right now. Um, okay. Yeah. So anyone's got any great tips? I'd love one. It. Yeah. I'm just going to leave a little pause if anyone wants to change Tim's life. Um, I don't think I'll change your life, but um, <laughs> one of the things that, um, you know, in a startup phase is you generally because, and I've only just heard of your organisation today, but generally speaking, you exist because there is actually a really strong foundation of people who support your cause. Um, and so what I would say is lead with those people um, and ask them to do, like sort of Jim said, they called up their patients and stuff like that and ask, sorry, um, families and asked, I mean, we're all fly doctors, I just didn't naturally say patients, um, <laughs> um, call up the families and sort of ask them if you, not with maybe a participation, but can you share this, you know, that sort of thing um, and, and really lead from the front in terms of like, don't be afraid. I know it can sometimes feel like as the founder, a bit self-serving to set up your own fundraising page. And um, I don't know, you mentioned that you and your family do a lot of biking. So maybe you set up a family page, you know, start leading with that because um, people will want to see participation from the core people because then that shows that it's a really um, supported um, event uh, virtually and um, I would encourage uh, yeah and then say okay after you've signed up to those core people um, share it and share it in all your networks and and say why it's important to them because generally speaking with grassroots peer-to-peer -peer fundraising it's not actually and I I know as a founder you're going to hate to hear this it's not about the cause it's about the people that are doing it people want to be a part of a tribe and they want to feel like they belong and so if they see their friends participating they will also want to participate and then it's your job to take them along the journey and create that cause connection if they don't already have it they probably do but <laughs> um you know if you're leaning on that strategy that can be um sort of the way a way to um encourage those signups is like start with your core group and then ask them to share um that way and maybe even add incentives for sharing and it doesn't have to be anything crazy just think about what might add value to people um you know uh but uh nothing's been to mind but it, <laughs> because it's 7 46 no I that's good two coffees that's um, good. <laughs> I actually went, I go do an ice bath most mornings and I walked, I walked in uh, to, it's a like sports recovery place and, and it's just my morning routine, but I walked in the guy I said, Hey, can I put some flies down, you know, for people coming in? And he go, yeah. and I said, and is, do you think there's any ways you could help us? And he just gave me 25 free passes to yeah. the ice bath. So we're going to leverage that to yeah. encourage people to sign up in the first, before the end of April, if you sign up, you'll get a, you know, the first 25 will get a free, you know, ice bath. So I know that, you know, <laughs> you're going to jump on a plane right now and, 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 and Where are you located, <laughs> Tim? on the Gold Coast. Yeah, not too far. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Drive that far for some torture. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, anyway, so that, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's, no. that, uh, that's really good advice. Uh, um, it and kind I, of happened per chance. Yeah. Sorry. I, th I think too, as much as, as it is a cause and it's all about doing a good thing for a charity you do need to be gimmicky you do need to sort of offer those incentives and, um or sort of pressure points which you probably can't really do with a um a free event um yeah i i think uh, a lot like what jim and erin were saying like it might not be that they are a biker and get excited about it but it's like Hey, we're just telling everyone, can you get it out there? Because they're going to be your advocates. Um, they're your biggest advocates. Yeah. And you might get some random bikers along the way. Yeah. Um, Tim, do you have any sponsors that, like a bike company or a brand of bike or anything on board that might be able to help you with some prizes and things like that or sponsorship? 
Well, we don't. And I've been knocking on doors and sending emails and it's yeah, just been one of those things where we haven't, haven't been able to sec- secure that yet. Um, a lot of the larger corporate companies, they, they're very, they indicated that they already have, you know, they don't just take on new things. They have their corporate plan and yada, yada. Um, and so, but we've gone with some more local ones as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, we've been trying and, and again, um, yeah, yeah. Just haven't, haven't managed to get that. So any tips on how to, how to secure a, a sponsor, that'd be great as well. Even also reaching out to your local councils and seeing if they can share it. Cause at the moment, obviously, um, you know, multiculturalism and so forth is very high um, on the radar. So they could share it through their social media's um, platforms as well, because I know that they're always looking for content. Um, right. so, well, you know, we do have nice one. Fit. We we actually, um, so the councillor here on the Gold Coast, um, one one of the districts, District 9, Mudjurabar, which is near where we are, um, which has a very big cycling community down here, which is, which is great. We're actually going to be at their street fair in May, the middle of May, the 16th, I think it is. And we've got an exercise bike that's going to be in the middle of that, the big family street fair. And we're going to encourage people to jump on and have a try. And, and so they've got behind under mm. us, which is really great. Um, Even gyms with the, you know, the cycling yes, spin bikes, um, spin like bikes because that. that's huge at my gym. So, yeah. So again, it's just knocking on doors and, and mm. going in and, presenting a lot of them though you know the larger more you know they're like well we get this all the time and so they'll be like i can't really do it i have to ask head office or can you send an email to head office but but you you're you're right you just got to keep pushing and and good one though congratulations yeah. um, i was just going to say i mean it looks amazing um, the concept is really really good i think there's a few people on here that wished they got that many things right in their first campaign. Um, so really well done. From our point of view, the best investment we ever made in giving Day Loud Shirt Day is the PR company that we work with. Um, so they, you know, it is a bit of an investment, but they work so respectfully with the beneficiaries and they have the direct contacts to radio, newspaper, television, um, and then amazing at telling the stories and we've been able to I guess tangibly measure that investment against the, the income that's been generated and part of it. So even if it's not something you can invest in this year, that's worth the conversation and worth considering for the future. Um, but you know it, it looks amazing. Quite often the first year is about awareness and people becoming used to the concept. So if you look at it as a two, three, four, five year plan on what it actually could be, um, I think you've got something really strong there. So well done. Thanks, Jim. Um, maybe you could share with me, uh, I'd love to connect more a bit about, you know, some of the, the more details about taking on a PR, um, yeah, company to, to help you with that. Um, obviously, yeah, budget constraints we have now, but still um, l- learning where that, we could, you know, work towards that so that we get a good return on investment. That'd be great. And it's a real, I think it's a real, it's not just an event for you. It's, it is a PR activity. It's, it's a way to get your brand out there. Um, I think you can have multiple wins there. I'm just conscious of time and um, feel free to uh, reach out to Tim and offer more advice and, and ideas and, and uh, you know, free marketing help um, along the way. We might jump to Jim as well here. Um, and if you've got any feedback or ideas or questions for Jim and, the, and his giving day, um, is, there, is there something that you're burning to know, Jim, that someone can help you with? Um, I think sometimes it's, uh, it's that awareness of knowing what you don't know, I guess. Um, so we're always looking for that magic bullet and how do we go next level. Um, the challenge we have is that we're quite a niche cause. So, you know, we can connect with those thousand families and people who directly be impacted by hearing loss. Going beyond that audience is really hard. So when we're looking to grow campaigns, we have to make connections with 
a greater range of people, I guess, and that, that's all I can challenge. It's not a question, and I definitely won't solve all your problems, Jim. Um, but I just <laughs> wanted to say, um, you know, Giving days are very like the hot topic um, of last year um, and I've seen a lot of organisations do giving days but what I was really heartened by hearing your um, presentation just then is how you didn't follow the prescription like to the letter and it worked for you because you listened to what your actual audience was and what your donors wanted, what you're talking about in terms of you kept your DM because your donors, you know what your donors do with your DM um, and you did break, you know, you pushed the organisation to break some of their rules but in a way that was respectful um, in terms of calling the families and stuff like that and I just think that that is something that a lot of organisations should have the courage to do more is yes, follow, take an idea like the giving day but you don't need to completely follow the mould of giving days because I do think that, that a lot of charities have been guilt maybe not guilted but like forced into following a prescription that doesn't work for their donors and I and I think that you know that then doesn't have a payoff for them and clearly you guys understood your donors which is so important and which meant you delivered a way for them to give that was joyful for them and um as well as delivering the results. So it's not a question, it's just a comment to say, I think that's really awesome. I think something you said there, joyful was really important. When I look back to giving day itself, it, it was joy. People just enjoyed the experience. And that was the staff here and the whole staff, the clinical team were, were sat at the eight o'clock at night, constantly refreshing the page until we hit the target. Um, and the donors enjoyed it. They enjoyed seeing their, their gift matched. Um, understanding and caring about our people was so important. And every email and every phone call began with reaching out to ask how they were um, in a really authentic way. And our telefundraisers had absolute permission to, you know, because some people were losing their jobs. A lot of people we were calling were doing it so. So they had absolute permission that if the answer to that indicated we shouldn't follow with an ask, but to wish them all the best and, and move on. I think that's so important in this climate as well. Um, and uh, because, yeah, there are a lot of people losing their job and doing it tough. And that doesn't mean that they don't care about the cause. Um, and it's something that as a fundraiser, you need to grapple with, like, because you're getting pressure for um, to meet targets, but then you're also a lot of the time you're also on the phone listening to that you know desperation from people so it's sort of something that you have to so that good on you guys for having that um in place as well with the tele fundraisers um yeah i think you've tapped into something like important to focus on too jim is that that experience and that joy like i think even if you can bring that into the campaign how that looks that you know it, it's it's exciting that you your it's exciting and fun to see your donation grow but then also as as the team like what happens on that day what happens in the in the week lead up like because it's your people that's going to really drive it and if they're excited mm -hmm. and they're having fun and enjoying it like i think that's a big thing and i know i know that's kind of a, a big deal with the giving days is is making that buzz um, on the giving day, like, can, can you give any sort of insight into how that looked on the day? And it might help people here. It might help um, Tim launch his bike event, or um, yeah, or we might have ideas or tips along that line. It was May last year, so very much during COVID time. So you know, we talked to other organisations like RSPCA about the giving days, and we saw the images of these amazing vibrant phone rings um, with lots of people and we couldn't do any of that so I think we had six people in here all very much socially distanced um, so the key thing in engaging the wider team was was celebrating their successes and publicly sharing their successes so the school screening team who you know certainly never done phone calls to our families of that kind before 
you know, we had to share the outcome of that. And when that donation came in the next day from one of the moms, where our school screener had called her and felt she was too busy and she got off the phone fairly quick and said, just send an email. So that to result in a four-figure donation. You know, that Matt, one of our school screeners, was, was walking around so fair the next day. Um, so just sharing the, those successes. And when I said working at who's the right person to talk to our audiences, when we emailed our families, we did so from the clinical team because their relationship is with the clinical staff, it's with the business support staff, it's me from the reception. It's not necessarily with other fundraisers. Um, so again, engaging them in that way, but then making sure that we see like the impact of what they achieve, I think, was really important. And at the end of the day, they say that the money that was raised means that they can continue doing this work. So, you know, Wendy Scaife talked all the time about the culture, the importance of a culture of fundraising within an organization. And yeah, it's something we've worked really hard to try and um, embed it here. But, uh, Jim, yeah. when is your giving day? Uh, I forgot that bit, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, May 27. Oh, great. And I think I think sharing those behind the scenes things too, like mm. you know, pictures, it, encouraging the team wherever they are to you know take photos of them on the phone or them getting together to phone people, and because people are only going to support, I guess, I guess the, the if they see the core team passionate about it and getting behind it, then they'll go, oh yeah, we like those guys. Um, if they're passionate about it, then we'll we'll do it. Yeah. I also followed um, Mummy's Wish. They did a giving day. I think it was last year or the year before. And I couldn't get off that day. They just kept updating their social media with these great photos and their target and where they're at. And the enthusiasm was just contagious. So I recommend having a look at their social media if you haven't um, and going back to them just to see what they did. Because, you know, I was literally every couple of hours going on just to see where they were at and, you know, knowing that my part of my donation was part of that as well. But congrats on doing the triple um, gift as well. That's amazing. Yeah, still have some work to do there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's public now, so we have to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good really good. Congrats, guys. Um, well, actually, we... just another tip for Tim quickly, if I can. Um, and it's something I've just done. It's just our late shirt day campaign is a peer-to-peer -peer campaign. Um, sign up for somebody else's campaign. Um, and watch the journey that they take you on. So I'm currently um, registered for Rosita the Day in June, um, and they're doing a fantastic job to the point of when I signed up, I had no intention of making an $80 donation, but <laughs> their communication somehow made me do it. So sign up and you know, learn what others are doing as well. It's really helpful. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Tim, I'd be happy to have a look at, like, if you've got a bit of a marketing plan, I'd, I'd be happy to have a look over it and uh, offer marketing any tips plan. there too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we, I, I've actually been real grateful. I have a, a cinematographer that has, has put together a whole video timeline of when we're releasing in yeah. line with our phases. But, um, but yeah, I, yeah, I don't have, have, anything like fully developed but um i'll be happy to share what i do have and and get some more more input for sure. add some padding to it for sure and yeah. you, can i ask a quick question with the family or the couple that are learning to cycle like learning to yeah. ride a bike you're going to keep the journey through the yes. campaign oh that's so yeah amazing. so we're going to that's take them people on a, on a journey of their story and um and uh yeah just and on the actual day, on on um, World Refugee Day, the final day of our of the ride, um, we're having a bit of a presentation. We've got the mayor of Toowoomba coming on, and we'll have Jordan Elise on a bit of a live event, and and as well as obviously releasing a few different videos of them meeting for the first time because they're in Toowoomba, um, the refugees and the the couple are training here on the Gold Coast. We're going to have them meet, and so yeah, that's kind of one particular story that we're actually going to um take their their campaign and actually market it on a on another website called little phil 
um, that that kind of a, a new kind of um, fundraising platform. So that'll be like almost a standalone thing that appears there as well as as people can donate it there just because that's such a compelling story, I think. And we'll probably build on the back of that for some of our PR as well, leading up to, to World Refugee Day, which is only like the month before the Olympics as well. And so, um, yeah, so yeah, that's our, our hope, but we've just got to pull it off, you know, <laughs> and it do it great. well, do it well. Not, we realize it's, we don't want to, we really want to add value. We don't want it to be like a, an annoying, oh, you're just running another one of these and asking for money kind of thing. So that's the, that's the challenge, I guess. We're just trying to feel out like how often do you post to encourage people to get involved and how often do you post to, to like you say, share the joy of the experience and, and add value. That's it can be really kind of, we just kind of, we have no, marketing PR or company to that has all the research and experience we're just trying to feel it ourselves a bit it's a rule of four four posts one should be an ask okay <laughs> that's the that's the general agreed upon thing but I think mm-hmm. it's important to note that like when you share a story you know if it is it's for example that that um couple you can if they've got more content on their donation page you can say to read more about their story head here it's not an explicit ask you're sharing Mm. content but if it's hosted on their fundraising page Mm. then the ask is done for you there yeah and i think the key is also engaging content so if you don't have anything good to say don't say anything okay and Jim, are you using my cause again this year for yours? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know there's a couple out there, um, but we found them really good and very cost effective as well. Great. Well, I, I want to just thank everyone, um, especially Tim and Jim, for sharing this morning, but also just for this little community that we had this morning. Yeah. Um, because we were encouraging each other and giving each other ideas. Um, but yeah, lots of warm fuzzies as well to hear about your stories. And um, I think, you know, I might not sign up to, to uh, ride a bike, but I want to hear about um, this family that are learning to, to bike ride. Um, so you've tapped into something really good there. But yeah, thanks everyone for coming along this morning. And hopefully we will see you again shortly for our next one. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, as soon as we get the recording, I'll have it out to share um, for others that might not have been able to make it this morning. But thank you everyone and I hope you have a great day and feel free to reach out and connect to everyone here, offer advice or ask for help. That's what we're all here for and uh, have a great day.